Um, all right, let's get started properly now. Um, before we get to the usual, you know, final questions for the final exam, that's something I'm going to do in the end of this session, hopefully. Um, so if you have any questions, then feel free to ask me at the end. I'll try to make at least five minutes, you know, time for you. Um, but I'll, of course, rush through the rest that we have to cover today. Okay, so um, I think last week we ended with this particular or with these particular stills. We were talking about post-colonialism and I said that one of the more notable uh, theories is Orientalism. So we were, or I was at least, sort of kind of already talking about Orientalism, but I didn't really have the time to explain. So this is what we're going to do now. I hope that at least some of you have watched the clip. Um, if not, then you'll have to sit here and listen to me um, while I explain in great or greater detail Orientalism. So the thing is, before we get to Orientalism, and this is something I conveniently or inconveniently left out last week, we need to very briefly talk about othering, which I have implicitly talked about last week already when we were talking about questions of race and ethnicity and how people that look different and how their differences are sort of embedded and imbued with social difference. So in this case, a different skin color denotes also different characteristics, um, different social treatment, different cultural treatment. And this process, and this is sort of what we can break Orientalism to a certain degree down onto, is othering. And othering does not mean anything else but sort of pointing out certain differences. In this case, Lomba says that in order to declare someone as the other, and in this case, the capitalization is vital, othering is usually capitalized, um, one has to emphasize opposing characteristics. And if you think back on the map of the British territories of the 19th century, we saw that the white Westerner was certainly portrayed very differently than um, the sort of the ones from the East, the others from the East. Um, the most efficient and simple way of doing this and this othering is through stereotyping, which in itself is not a lack of knowledge, as some could presume, but certainly a way of processing knowledge. So if we talk about stereotyping, this is not necessarily a negative thing. It can be used for negative purposes, certainly, but generally stereotyping is simply a very productive way of ordering knowledge and processing knowledge. Um, the function of stereotyping the own and the other's identity is to perpetuate an artificial sense of difference between self and other. And this process is dialectic. If I imply certain characteristics about someone else, I also, or if I state, you know, this person is not punctual, he or she is lazy, etc., etc., then I implicitly state that I'm punctual. I am not lazy, I'm hardworking. So by stereotyping and characterizing the other, um, oneself is usually also characterized by everything that is sort of negated by the other. And again, I said that we see these mechanisms when we look at the map of the British territories, but we also see that here not only in terms of color, but also in terms of objects that are being seen in the frame. Um, the thing is, when we talk about the Orient and the Occident, and I'm going to use inverted commas at least once here, simply because these are categories that are in some way man-made, and not only man-made, but Western men, white men made, so to speak. So we need to be really careful with uh, categories like Occident and Orient, simply because they are inherently constructed categories. And if we talk about the Orient, in this case, we see even more stereotyping and very clear pictures and very clear stereotypes because the quote I've just shown you on othering goes on. And in this case, it goes on to state, if the colonialized people are irrational, should I just wait until everyone sat down and I'm not quite sure what kind of music is playing, but let me just awkwardly stare at people and wait. I think that makes it really, really comfortable for both of us. The good thing is we don't have uh, this lecture in the so-called Bombentester. Okay, maybe I'm, I'm going to take that one back. But you know, the Lichtenfeld Hörsaal in the, I think it's the Zornerbau, every time someone moves, the lecturer is not you know, audible any longer, and I have the strange feeling that this is the minor way and the minor form of this. Okay, I can move on, perfect. 
Moving on, as I was just saying, the quote I've just given you on othering goes on to specifically address the Orient. And it says, if the colonized people are irrational, Europeans are rational. So this is the dialectic sort of relationship I was talking about. If the colonialized are barbaric and sensual and lazy, Europeans are civilization itself with its sexual appetites under control and its dominant ethic that of hard work. If, and here he addresses the Orient in particular, if the Orient is static, Europe is developing. The Orient has to be feminine so Europe can be masculine. And this is something we see time and time again when we look at the Orient, namely that the Orient and the people from the East, and we'll see why I say the people from the East without defining what kind of culture they're from, um, is usually feminized. It is hypersexualized, it is always desirous, and it's always somewhat a temptation for the white Westerner, a temptation that often has to be overcome in general. So moving on or moving back sort of to finally define Orientalism. So what is Orientalism if we look at this sort of construct? Orientalism discusses how the East, and in this case it is an ambiguous East, it's not very well defined, it's under complex, uh, is created through Western discursive practices, that is anthropology, tourism, fiction, etc., etc., and constructed as an other which can, however, be only known be only known by the dominant discourse of the West and thus be assimilated into its practices and produced inferior in so far, etc., etc. So the important point is that the Orient and something that is something, uh, you know, Orient is a word and a term we use consistently. If you think back to the entire, I'm calling it the refugee crisis of 2015, we saw the question of the East, you know, they come to the Occident. Whereas they, most people that use these terms are inherently unaware of the fact that these are constructed term, uh, terms, which are definitely ideological terms. So they come with certain ideological implications. And these implications are usually that the West is complex, they are rational, they are civilized, while the East usually isn't. And the, this image of the East is produced by the West. If we... I'm, I hope I have given you the example of John Barrow last week, um, but also if we later look at Aladdin, we also see the same things. These are, this is how the East is viewed through the eyes of the West. So what the West is doing is it creates a complex orient suitable for the study in the academy, for display in the museum, for reconstruction in the colonial office, for theoretical illustration and anthropological, biological, linguistic, racial, and historical thesis about mankind and the universe. So the Orient that is being produced is not a real place in a way. It's an amalgamation of various different cultures that are situated sort of across the border from the West. Um, and I'm, I hope I have that. So Orientalism, this is... I'm just leaving the quote out, but generally it is the West that has the authority to be able to construct the East, and the East is constructed through, for instance, travel literature. So every time a 19th century traveler or explorer came back to state, oh, by the way, they all either eat people or they have these spices and they all live in jungles and they all are dressed in very weird animal hides. This is a construction of the East by the West. And this has become not only sort of legitimized, but authorized because these kinds of ideas are being produced and reproduced in museums. They are being shown, they are being published. So this sort of idea of the Orient has been solidified over the course of a couple of centuries. And this solidification is probably best seen in Aladdin, both the 1992 version and the 2019 version. Because what do we see? And we're going to talk about the two levels of the film in a bit. So the first level is, of course, the visual, while the second is the textual. And I'm going to start exactly the other way around. Before we come to how the East is portrayed with the tea and the spices, etc., etc., we're going to be looking at the text very briefly. Again, I'm not going to read it out. What I've done so far is simply to sort of show you the stereotyping that is being done with regard to both the East and the West. So the first one is, of course, the construction to a certain degree, generally of the place of the Orient. So the Orient is 
um, sort of characterized by having the bazaar, you bang the drums, and it's only the drums, it's not an orchestra, it's not sophisticated, it is simple. Um, it is, of course, the name that connotes a certain Arabian um, kind of potentially Arabian origin. We have the Sunday Salam, we have the coterie, so there is a lot of people. Um, we have a, a hundred bad guys with swords, and the swords that are being portrayed are those sli slightly curved swords. So they are not British swords, they are not rapiers, but they are primitive swords, so to speak. Um, and in this case, Ali, or Prince Ali, Aladdin is constructed as he has 75 golden camels and he has peacocks and exotic type mammals. Um, he has a zoo, so again, what we've seen when I showed you the picture of the Jungle Book, that there is this sort of uh, merging of the people from the East and the animals from the East, so to speak, that are sort of put on a very equal level. This is done in this song too, to a certain degree again. Um, also, what denotes the place that we are talking of, that this is the Orient, we have adjust your veil and prepare. So usually Western Europeans do not wear a veil, but the East does it. Um, we also have the white Persian monkeys and the 60 elephants, llamas galore, with his bears and lions, which are very odd in this sort of menagerie that you know the genie is sort of portraying. And of course, we have the 40 fakirs. So, the thing is, this, simply using this imaginary is conductive of creating a certain, certain visual. So this is the place where we are at, which is just a little exotic, and this exoticism comes mostly from the animals that are being used and, of course, portrayed. But it's not just enough to portray them, it's also necessary to mention them, because no white Western European would probably have Persian monkeys or exotic-type mammals Although, again, the bears and the lions, okay, fair enough. But generally, this sort of exoticism is constructed through a link between the humans there as well as the animals. Moving on to look at the people of the Orient, if they are not the people that adjust their veils or have, you know, are bad guys with swords, etc., etc., the people are, or at least in this case, uh, also Prince Ali, is a bit difficult because he has. And this is the, the uh, I'm not quite sure whether you've noticed, I've just exchanged it because this is the part of the 1992 version where they say he's got slaves, he's got servants and flunkies which are proud to work for him, which um, is an entire Pandora's box in just that one statement. But they're also lousy with loyalty. So um, in this case, the not, it's not Ali who is... In, he is implicitly characterized as being rich and being a genuine ruler, which is interesting because Aladdin within this, um, within the, the film is often a little westernized, so his features are not necessarily Arabian or Indian or anything else, but they are certainly a little best westernized. He is usually paler, or his skin is paler or fairer. He is not necessarily um, the Jafar kind of guy, so to speak. He had, hasn't got a beard, he's not dark-skinned, etc., etc. So there's a, a link of he's a genuine ruler where servants and slaves like to work for him. So he is, to a certain extent, a colonializer who colonializes certain people, but they like working for him to a certain extent. Um, but they are also lousy, lousy with loyalty. So in this case, the people of the Orient are generally lazy, they're lousy, and they're not loyal to their rulers. So generally, the Orient is a place of, of dissonance, of discrepancy, where political systems don't quite work. So in this case, the West is, of course, um, more civilized. They have working political systems because if the Orient or the people of the East and the Orient are lousy with loyalty, the people in the West are not. They adhere to the rules of their monarchs, of their authorities, which of course the East doesn't do. And what we also see, because I said that the Orient often sexualizes and makes uh, the people of the East desirous, we see that to a very to a slight degree both with Aladdin and with Jasmine. So. Prince Ali is amorous. Um, he's not only in love, but he is desirable as a man because, of course, he's got riches. He's got people that like to work for him. So that makes him desirable from a social standpoint. So 
technically the Western white man who sees it could identify to a certain degree with Aladdin, not because he looks good, but because he has the riches that probably the white Western man also desires to have. But Aladdin, and Ali in this case, has something else, or Agrabah has something else. Namely, um, it has a princess. I heard your princess was hot. Where is she? So again, Jasmine becomes an object that is equally just as the, the white Persian monkeys and the mammals and the Sioux and the peacocks and everything, all of these are sort of status symbols. And Jasmine becomes not only also a status symbol, so she is again aligned with all of the animals that are being shown here and the general riches of Ali or of Aladdin, um, but she's also hot. So Jasmine isn't intelligent, she isn't a politically viable choice, but she's hot. Then that's the only thing. And she's desirable both for the beauty of that and the fact that Darko is thinking that we don't have to watch the scene that then you're like, it's quite a big spot. Um so let me just check if everything works. Um the amount of visual culture you have to know for the exam is very, very, very tiny. Very tiny. <laughs> extremely tiny. It's not nil, but it's tiny, tiny. So don't worry, don't fret. There's no scene analysis. Okay, moving back as if nothing has happened, back to Orientalism. Where was I? Okay, the visual sort of um, rendering of the Orient. So in this case, we have the reference to the bazaar and the drums. So again, the music isn't necessarily either Arabian and uh, Arabian or Indian, but they're inspired by different cultures. Again, the Orient is an amalgamation of most cultures, which are not necessarily well defined. So in this case, Agrabah and the bazaars are sort of, uh, they have spices. Also, do you really store spices that way? I mean, I just imagine a child running by, banging into that table and all the spices go So, you know. Um, a Western wouldn't, of course, store them that way. They would be storing it properly. Um, also, we have the tea as well as the certain uh, the, the sweets, the crystallized and caramelized sweets. Again, very typical of a not a particular but a, an ambiguous kind of East. Something that if you ask someone, what do you think when I say Orient, they would probably say spices, tea, something sweet probably, elephants, etc., etc. Um, and when I said that we talk of the Orient as a sort of um, amalgamation of an ambiguous kind of East that isn't really well defined to be Indian or Arabian or uh, anything else, the, we see that in particular when it comes to the ways um, sort of Prince Ali's um, people are being dressed. So we have more or less Indian-inspired, military-inspired kinds of uniforms. We have the large, a really large turban, also the, the dress of the genie. We have um, something that is more akin to the Brazilian uh, dances during the carnival. We have belly dances. It is basically everything that is east of Poland is kind of merged into one, unless it's Russia. That's not merged into it. But generally everything that seems a bit tropical, that seems a bit exotic, is thrown into it to create not a, a um, sort of an, an orient that is really there, but an impression of an orient. An impression sort of the um, because we, we did talk about um, William Comp and the search for the picturesque, the scene and the character are important. It's not about truth. It's not about creating a complex Orient. It's about creating an image, an idea of the Orient. Something that, as Said says, and I'm just going to go back to, to the quote, um, he says that it's a complex Orient. Complex in this case is well, debatable, uh, but it's a complex orient suitable for study in the academy. And this is the point. It's not about creating an orient that is really there. It's simply creating something that can be studied, something that can be looked at, something that is desirable and exotic, not something that really exists in some place. And this is the vital part. Okay, um, any questions concerning orientalism or sort of the, the verbal textual level? Because that 
we can, we can do a much more in-depth reading of it. We can, again, um, especially with the, with the 2019 film, it is, there is a very interesting interview where, where someone says that we used mostly South Asian, but also Egyptian people, you know, people from the regions. Also, they, they will, yes. I think one of the problems with the turban is that it explodes. It explodes in a shower of flowers, but you have this very strange, I mean, the 1992 version was made right after the Gulf War. So it tried to sort of ease the east-west relations. In this case, we have something that cranks this up to 11. You still have the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, ha ha, it explodes, you know, people from the west, terrorism. Um, but it's of course, you know, it explodes in flowers, so it's not that threatening. So the Orient or the East is rendered non-threatening by having this comically large and exploding in a shower of flowers. This is one reading. It's not the reading generally, you know, that, that's not something, something to have, you have to describe or ascribe to, but something that is definitely possible to use as a reading. So super problematic when it comes to the Torben. Yeah. Um, so you mean just not critiquing it as a sort of, uh, it, it creates some kind of orientalist picture? You, you can, you can read it from different perspectives. That is something, you know, if you just read it as poetry in this case, you can, ah, okay. Um, also, you cannot work, which is also something. Um, you can, oh my God, technical equipment, brilliant, where is the text? Just let me awkwardly scrub through all of this. So you can definitely read it as something else. You can also read it as a positive image of the Orient. You can read it as a sort of, you know, because usually the, the West has constructed itself as being generally the more rich and the more complex. And this would also allow a reading of the Orient being just as much rich, just as uh, productive, etc., etc. So you don't need to have Orientalism as a theoretical tool to read this song, but you, it, it certainly sort of lends itself. The entire movie, weirdly enough, lends itself to reading it in, in Said's way, um, or sort of by using Said's uh, theories. Um, okay. So, again, what I've said, the, the creation of Agraba is, in this case, it's not, and what supports the idea of being a more ambiguous form and, and image of the Orient is also that Agraba is, of course, not a real place. It is a mystical place that does not exist as such. And there are many more readings, again, the American actors that play, or people, you know, the only one that has an accent is Jafar the evil bad guy in this case, both in the 1992 version and in the 2019 version. Everyone else has an American accent. Having Will Smith playing the genie, simply or similarly to having uh, Robin Williams play. Is it Robin Williams? Is it? Ah, anyway. Um, Generally, having American actors play, you know, the main characters, the good guys, certainly also implicates that we have a sort of benign kind of main character that even Westerners can identify with. So that is um, generally also what, what, the, what the song kind of does, what the movie um, by and large does. Okay. Again, just to, to kind of go through um, the image that is created, we of course in this case don't have the half-dead hash smokers. Um, that would mostly be something we would find in images or movies that are being made about uh, China in particular. Usually by the during the 19th century, we have the opium dens that are being used. We have sword swallowers, veiled women, nearly naked veiled women, belly dancers, acrobats, caramels, elephants, Bengal tigers. Everything we also find in um, sort of just the song Prince Ali, but something we find in Aladdin generally, um, they refuse to represent the Orient created by the European Academy, something I've already said. By combining this material undistinguished into one field, the distinctive signatures of these cultures, that is China, India, Arabia, Morocco, etc., etc., are erased and replaced by familiar ideological configuration. So they are replaced by a feeling of the other rather than very um, sort of complex and distinguished cultures in general. 
Um, again, just to sum it up, one of the chief thing things about Orientalism is its confusing amalgamation of imperial vagueness, yet precise detail. We still see the spices we have, I think, in Arabian Nights. Um, the lyrical eye, or the genie in this case, talks about I believe the, the cardamom, so we have certain precise details that are being taken from each and every culture, but what's being created is the sort of melting pot of cultures that is simply titled the Orient. Okay, um, which brings us to the question, or maybe just a, a very brief side note, simply because Orientalism is not used too much or too often, but we need to be aware of the fact that Orientalism and the Orient is generally binary and it is fused and sort of implicated in this binary of West and East. And these relationships are far more complex than Orientalism can genuinely really frame. So what we have is we have distinct problematic relationships, we have hybridity, we have colonialized, decolonialized, or the East sort of mimicking the West and the West mimicking the East. So these relationships are far more complex and far more complicated than Orientalism can really fathom to a certain degree. However, that being said, are there any questions concerning Orientalism uh, concerning that so far? Yes. Um, put a pin in that. We'll go through a different reading to a generally more broadly post-colonial reading in a minute, where exactly that features where the, the, the Westerner sort of is immersed in the culture and becomes part of the culture of the, of the East or of the natives. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying the first thing that comes to mind, are you kidding me? Of course it'll be in the exam. Everything I talk about will, to a certain extent, be in the exam. And if it's not going to be this exam, it's going to be the exam in some semester later. Um, I'm not going to answer the question of will this be in the exam. So if that's your question for the end, don't ask it. Generally, the more I spend time on a certain topic, the more likely it is that it's going to be featured in the exam. Does that, is, is that a clear enough yes? Very good. OK. Moving on to post-colonialism and a sort of summary of post-colonial readings. Why do we need post-colonial theory? Why do we need to be looking at things like Orientalism? Why do we need to look at things like uh, literatures? Or why do we, should we use uh, comments like, or uh, terms um, just like, you know, not literature in English, but literatures in English or English literature and so on and so forth. So why do we need to be conscious of post-colonial theory? And in this case, and just to sum it up again with a quote, post-colonial readings attempt to rethink, uh, recuperate, and reconstruct racial, ethnic, and cultural others that have been repressed, misrepresented, omitted, stereotyped, and violated by the imperial West with all its institutions and strategies for dominating the non-Western. So what post-colonial theory helps us with is breaking up these somewhat essential binaries of the West being good and the East being bad, so to speak, or to break up these, these ideas of, for instance, Aladdin being, you know, sort of a, can be read as an oriental piece that sort of reconfirms and solidifies all of these stereotypes that we have had since the East has been discovered by the West, again, in inverted commas. So again, they allow us to give, or not us, but they allow people to give or to have a voice um, people that usually would not, have a vo would not have had a voice, so to speak. And that is done in various ways. So resistance can come from deconstructive readings of, um, you know, of, of classics, for instance. It can come of rewriting classics. So there have been um, rewrites of, for instance, Jane Austen novels. But it can also come from writing in your own native language and not writing in English, uh, English not using the, the colonializer's language to a certain degree. But it can also help us, as, as, as people from the West generally, um, to sort of trace our own colonial history. In Germany, that's always a bit difficult because Germany is je technically not considered to be a colonial power, which unsurprisingly it still is, but that's usually something that is omitted in most 
history lessons, or at least when I was in school, it was mostly a, by the way, we had colonies, moving on. Um, and this is, of course, something that also helps us to confront our own colonial past, to retrace how we are being influenced by um, colonial powers, by our own colonial past. Um, and that brings us, or brings me, to a second post-colonial reading. So I hope, I think, I presume that most of you are familiar with um, Avatar, the first part, not the way of water. Okay, I see some people nodding. That's fine. Doesn't matter if only one's nodding. If you haven't seen it, don't watch it. If you've seen Pocahontas, just paint them blue and it's literally exactly the same movie. Okay, so looking at post-colonial readings of franchises, and especially with, with Avatar or with Pocahontas, that is a more of a, well, duh, kind of reading. But generally, we are still going to do that, at least very briefly. So Avatar is technically a, a problematic movie um, when it comes to post-colonial and colonial relations. So, you know, just to give you a rough framing, um, Earthlings, people from this earth, moved to Pandora to mine its resources. And when I say mining resources, they both mine the natural resources and they use the human resources. And if we look at the main character, Jake, and the Navi, the, cl the clan of the local people there, we see very similar, even though the movie doesn't make it too plain, but yet again it does, we see the same kind of colonial relations that we've seen in other movies, that we've seen time and time again, whether it's Dancing with Wolves or whether it's anything else to do with Native Americans. These kinds of tropes are being reproduced and solidified in this movie, just not as obviously as in other movies, potentially. So one thing I've said, that there is some kind of linguistic imperialism usually in um, areas where the British have uh, colonialized people. So technically, um, the natives have their own language, but in general, they don't speak. Even though Navi, the language is spoken in the movie, Jake at first doesn't understand what they are speaking, and it also doesn't matter because at some point, Natiri, the female main character, sort of switches into English or switches into her own language, but then it's spoken in English so that both the viewer and Jake can understand it. That's being made even more plain in the second movie where they start out speaking Navi and then it kind of switches into English so that everyone can understand it. And this is something that is being, or that we can see in a number of products of visual culture. If you've ever seen or played um, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, you see that really, really made plain. So unless it is important for the story, unless it's important for the quest, so to speak, the language will be either not understood, so there won't be any subtitles that's being done in Avatar in the beginning. You hear Navi, but you don't understand because Jake doesn't understand. But eventually, once it becomes really vital for the story and for the narration, it's of course translated into English or into whatever dubbed version it is simply because it's vital both for Jake as the main character as well as for the viewer. So we have a certain linguistic question and um, that sort of also comes with the Navi being studied. So every time we talk about local and native people, then we of course have also an avatar, the question of studying them. So at le at, in the first part at least, the Navi are not there to be, you know, to, to, to be diplomatically drawn in, to, you know, make relations with them to a certain degree, but they are there to be studied by the scientists that come from Earth. And this is sort of Jake's first um, sort of task to do. He needs to study them as different people, as a different culture. So the studying, again, um, is vital. It's also vital that the Navi are very, very, very tightly linked to nature. So we again have the idea of the others and the native people usually being concerned with nature, being linked to it, being linked to the animals. In this case, the Navi have a sort of, is it a genetic link? Not quite sure. They have their little wiggly tentacles where they, what they, doesn't matter. They put that on. I mean, you've seen the movie. I don't need to explain that. Anyway, they have a very, very close link both to the goddess of nature as well as nature itself. They can sort of talk to the animals. They can calm them down. Again, that sort of re um, perpetuates this idea of the native people being closely linked to, to nature, something we've seen time and time again. Um, 
as I said, the Navi have a language, but they don't speak. Um, in this case, Jake speaks for them. Only when Jake speaks for them, they are actually being heard. So they need the white Westerner in the avatars in the avatar state. That's a completely different kind of uh, visual cultural product. But they need him in the avatar in order to be understood, in order to be heard. But on only when Jake speaks, um, his fellow colonializers sort of listen to him and help the Navi. Without him, that would not have been possible. So you could argue, you know, he's a, a diplomatic link or whatnot, but in general, he is just the the white male Western guy who's middle-aged who comes in and saves the day because people listen to him. Um, Jake generally also lives and fulfills a certain fantasy of his. Um, so he is a disabled man, but due to a genetic or due to his twin brother having this genetically grown avatar, he can sort of live out his fantasy of being an able-bodied man again. So the first thing he does is he says, my legs, and then he runs. So this is one of his fantasies. But that fantasy goes on because Jake's story is not just of a disabled man becoming abled again, but it's of someone who is sort of downtrodden becoming or receiving social status. So in this case, Jake eventually becomes the chief of the Navi after he's inconveniently killed the former chief. But he's, of course, accepted by the Navi as being their crowned king to a certain degree. He's also adopted into the Navi clan, which fulfills the idea and the fantasy of finally receiving social status, but also receiving a family that he has lost before the first movie starts. Moreover, um, he gets the girl, he finally has a love and sex life again. Um, so he generally he earns every triumph he can. He gets social status, he gets able, his able body back, so to speak, and he gets the girl on top of it. And she's, of course, a princess. So it's every, every fantasy rolled into one, and Jack's story sort of confirms that. Also, um, his avatar state and his being part of the Navi is somewhat of a play because the, his avatar, I want to say avatar state, please don't think of Ang and you know the avatar. If I say avatar state, I mean the big blue guys. So every time he goes into this sort of avatar, he has also the chance to end it. So he has all the privileges that come with being the colonializer while being able to sort of escape the plight of the natives. He has all the linguistic privileges, the social privileges, etc., etc. For him, his being native is simply what scholars have termed playing Indian, being the native for a very short period of time, but also being able to escape everything that comes with it. And this is what Jake does to a certain degree afterwards. I mean, he is incorporated into that, but he still retains his status as the intruder, as the colonializer to a certain degree. However, Jake is, of course, the benign colonializer. We have the, the bad general, so to speak, that also features in the movie. But Jake is the better option to a certain degree for the Navi. Um, the actors, that is, again, just... It's not a minor point, but it's some uh, one point that I need to mention. Most of the actors of the Navi are actually people of color. The colonializers are portrayed by white Western Americans. Everyone else isn't. So whether that's Zoe Saldana or whether it's uh, the chief, they are all people of color. So the Navi is basically, again, an amalgamation, an ambiguous amalgamation of different people, so to speak. Not one kind of person, not white Western, but a sort of other that is sort of ambiguous and not very well defined, something that can be studied easily in the academy, but not something that is inherently um, complex. Talking about complex, uh, complex and I'm um, just going to go through, talking about complex, the culture of the Navi is, you know, they're very concerned with nature, they are very in tune with nature, but their culture isn't very complex. So everything we see is just the stereotype of the Native American, someone who scowls, who yells, who kind of screams at intruders. They have primitive weapons. They fight with a bow and they have a spear. They don't have guns. They often don't know how to use them. They need Jake to teach them how to use guns. They don't have proper dress. So if you see the avatars of the colonializers, they are dressed in some kind of uniform. The Navi aren't. 
Um, also, there are no conflicts. Their leadership is inherited. It's not a democratic system. And it cannot be a democratic system because that would question the superiority of the white Westerner in this movie. Because if they have democracy, well, how do we construct ourselves against that? They need to have something more primitive, something more... Uh, something less complex, so to speak. And indeed, that culture is so under-complex to a certain degree that Jake learns how to, how to do it well in a very short span of time. So I think it needs three months, and he's absolutely proficient in the language and in how to you know, use the jungle and in how to move like um, one of the Navi and how, um, to go through all the rites, etc., etc. And not only that but he learns it um, better than they do. So he is the one, it's not Natiri, it's not one of the tribe, it's he that can sort of have this, I, it's one of these flying dragons, the large one, whatever. But he becomes sort of the, the legend and he, bec he is able to tame this beast. So he is even better than most of the Navi. Um, which also points to the fact that he obviously knows how to deal with that, but also that this culture can't be that complex if you can learn it in about three months and then even be better than the native people that have been living there for centuries, probably. It's also interesting that uh, the film ends with, um, I think, the, the text, it's, in, it's a fresh start in a new world. So the history of Pandora starts with the colonializer. It starts with Jake. It doesn't start with the Navi. And last but not least, uh, the resistance to the good colonializer, to Jake, is minimal at best. Sure, there is some resistance, but it feels like token resistance. The colonializers, the bad colonializers, the military, they are resisted violently, but Jake is taken up, and even more so, he's adopted into the tribe. He's adopted into the clan. He becomes a part of them, we, uh, of them which means that they have accepted his superiority, his leadership, and sort of that he is actually one of them when in fact he is absolutely not. But this is sort of the, the idea, and this is something that scholars that deal with post-colonial studies have noted. It is sort of the, the last point and the final piece of domination if the colonializer is accepted and if the colonialized sing the praises and the virtues of the colonializer. And this is to a certain degree what happens with Jake. He is being made into a myth, into a legend. All the tribes and all the clans accept him as the pro forma leader, so to speak. Something that would not have happened had he not been in his avatar, which would have probably also not happened if he had been in RV. Okay. That being said, again, this is one reading. You can put definite more readings to it, but this is a post-colonial reading of Avatar um, in general, very broadly speaking. Are there any questions before we move on to my favorite part, not the TLDR, I'm not going to go through that, but to visual culture? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. I I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, the thing is, it, it's it's similar to what happens with Jake, right? So even if people come back from the east, they are not made eastern. They can have the props. They can have, you know, they they. I'm not saying they might be tanned, but they come with certain behaviors and cultural practices, but they still retain the privileges of being white to a certain degree. Um, so for instance, Rudyard Kipling, again, the author of The Jungle Book, he was born half Indian. He has a Indian-inspired name, but he still retains the privileges of being a white English guy. So he was able to publish easily. He didn't have to go through the hurdles that would have been there for him had he not been half English. 
comes with a few problems, and this is again a, a half Indian, half English kind of thing, but even if you as a white Westerner go to a certain place and you adopt to a certain degree their cultural practices, behaviors, etc., etc., you still remain a white Westerner. Your skin color will still be a privilege, a privilege that is largely unseen, but will certainly help you both in the East and in the West, because in the West you're assimilated back. Oh, he's, he or she or they are one of us. But, you know, you, you're not being, even if you've spent, I don't know, 15 years in, oh, I don't know, India, for instance, you won't come back and certainly be half Indian. You'll still be a white Western European. People may know, oh, that person is behaving differently, but they'll cue on to the fact that, oh, yeah, it's just, you know, it's not a permanent kind of thing. It's not, you're not inflicted with the same kinds of social um, the same kind of social disregard or discrimination, you still have the privilege of being white, even though you've spent time abroad. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, with mi mixed mixed families, that's often a bit of a problem simply because they're not enough for one culture or the other. I think that's, um, uh, Jordan Peele said that uh, in an interview a couple of years ago when it came to, to us and Get Out, he said that um, his, his mother was upper class white, his father was black, um, who was absent, and he wasn't white enough for most of the, as a, I mean, he wasn't white, full stop, um, so he stuck out in, in white gatherings um, but he also wasn't black enough culturally, behaviorally, so to speak. I'm saying that in inverted commas. Please don't take that as, as uh, gospel or anything. But he said that um, his behaviors marked him out from his black and, and people of color fellows, so to speak, as being white. So he didn't belong in either or sort of culture, society, community, mostly community. Yeah. Any other questions? Hmm, again, silence is golden. I don't mind. Okay, visual culture. So it may come as no surprise to you that our society, especially Western society, is absolutely obsessed with images. So not only are our lives largely mediated through images, but we consume lives through images. Just look at the, yeah, I know, frankly, mind-boggling, but just look at the sort of development of social media that has gone from text-based social media more or less to visual-based social media. It's about pictures and uh, short videos, etc., etc. It's not so much about large and longish written texts any longer. So the visual has become a not only interesting but vital part of our culture. Which is a bit weird, frankly, simply because the image has also had a very long tradition of being criticized as being uh, too shallow and too easy and just an imitation of life that has no authenticity, etc., etc. So generally what we see is we have um, that seeing in Western culture is lionized. It's an important sense to have. Our lives are mediated and consumed through images, but the critique of the image of film and television and um, all kinds of visual media is still there. So I'm just going to go through a couple of criticisms that has not just turned up lately or in the 1930s with the Frankfurt School, but has been around for a pretty long time. So if we look, for instance, at Plato, he criticizes painting and art as being just an imitation. It's not something good. And he says, painting and art um, uh, are far from the truth when painting and imitation produce their work. So if you just look at nature or look at someone and paint it and imitate this real uh, thing, um, it keeps company with the worst part in us that is far from prudence and is not comrade or friend for any healthy uh, or with any purpose. So this is necessarily bad. Art and painting isn't something you should be doing. In his case, it's sculpturing that is actually very good, but painting in general really, really isn't. So Plato, I, I want to say he starts this tradition of a certain criticism of the gaze or of seeing and of visual culture, but he's not the first, nor will he be the last. 
So moving on a bit later, we of course have one of the uh, best proponents or criti uh, criticisms of the visual that is in the 1930s, the Frankfurt School. Most important, um, Max Horkheimer and uh, Theodor Adorno, they are very clear of what they think of visual culture. They focus mostly on films, mostly on Hollywood, very bad, and generally on popular culture. So cinema and, I mean, later on television are the huge no-go for them. They are not authentic, they are just imitations again, but they are also bad because they are made for the masses. So he says that jazz, in particular jazz, and uh, Beethoven, for instance, they are really good products, they are high cultural products, especially if they are reproduced with an orchestra. If you have them on, on vinyl and if you have them on CD, that's not so good because every time you can reproduce something easily, it loses its inherent value because it has no authenticity any longer and music and film and um, any other form of visual and audio culture needs to have authenticity. So, a theater play has authenticity. If you record it and if you film it as a movie, then it hasn't, because that movie can be easily reproduced the same way over and over again. And I have a really, really longish quote by Adorno here. I'm going to read out parts of it simply because he attaches the idea of films are being consumed by the masses and masses are notoriously stupid and passive. So he has a couple of ideas about the people that actually consume these kinds of, and he talks about consume, um, uh, um, these, these kinds of products of visual culture. So he says, Alle Massenkultur unter Monopol ist identisch und ihr Skelett, das von jenem fabrizierte begriffliche Gerippe, beginnt sich abzuzeichnen. An seiner Verdeckung sind die Lenker gar nicht mehr so sehr äh, interessiert. Seine Gewalt verstärkt sich, je brutaler sie sich einbe äh, einbekennt. Lichtspiele und Rundfunk brauchen sich nicht mehr als Kunst auszugeben. Die Wahrheit, dass sie nichts sind als das Geschäft, verwenden sie als Ideologie, die den Schund legitimieren soll, den sie vorsätzlich herstellen. So, just, you know, language-wise, he has a pretty clear, and he paints a pretty clear picture of what he thinks of Lichtspiele und Rundfunk, what he thinks of uh, Film and Radio. It's basically dirt. It's not very good. It's actually underkomplex, etc., etc. Um, Sie nennen sich selbst Industrien und die publizierten Einkommensziffern ihrer Generaldirektoren schlagen den Zweifel an der gesellschaftlichen Notwendigkeit der Fertigprodukte nieder. So it's not something that is made with any sort of sense, but it's just something you can easily consume, a Fertigprodukt. Um, der, der Schematismus des Verfahrens zeigt sich dahin, and I'm, uh, he is talking about the structures and the underlying structures of films, for instance, um, dass schließlich die mechanisch differenzierten Erzeugnisse als allemal das Gleiche sich erweisen. So they are not different and distinct from another. Dass der Unterschied der Chrysler und von der General Motors Serie im Grunde illusionär ist, weiß schon jedes Kind, das sich für den Unterschied begeistert. Was die Kenner als Vorzüge und Nachteile besprechen, dient nur dazu, den Schein von Konkurrenz und Auswahlmöglichkeiten zu verewigen. Nothing much has changed between the 1930s and now. <coughs> Mit äh, den Präsentationen der Warner Brothers und Metro Goldwyn Myers verhält es sich nicht anders. Aber auch zwischen den teuren und billigen Sorten der Musterkollektion der gleichen Firma schrumpfen die Unterschiede immer mehr zusammen. Bei den Autos so, auf solche von Zylinderzahl, Volumen, Patentdaten etc. Bei den Filmen auf solche der Starzahl, der Üppigkeit, des Aufwands an Technik, Arbeit, Ausstattung und der Verwendung jüngerer psychologischer Formeln. So what he says is basically that uh, whether it's cars or whether it's any other readily made product, it's the same thing with films. It's the same structures and the only difference of any movie is how much people or how much valid and valuable and famous stars you put into it or um, how, much, how much money you pay in order to make the film. So if we go back to Avatar, the only difference between Avatar and some kind of indie movie, for Adorno at least, would be that Avatar has different actors in it, it is definitely um, more expensive and it made more money. But there is no other difference. The structures of genre and the simple or the simplicity of most movies is the same across the board. So he says generally cinema and in, if he had written about television he would have been even more critical of television. He says it's all the same, it's all awful, it doesn't have any authenticity, it doesn't have any inherent value. Only things that cannot be technically reproduced have value. And in particular, anything that is a visual cultural product, that's definitely 
not something you want to consume because the masses that do consume it are passive and you don't really critically think of it. Something that high culture, of course, always does to you, so to speak. So high cultural products always make you think mass culture, popular culture doesn't. And if you think, oh, well, it's the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, mm, you know, maybe that has changed. Well, certainly it hasn't. If you look at Jameson, Frederick Jameson's quote, he is even more clear about how dangerous and problematic the image is because the image and the visual is essentially pornographic, which is to say it has its end in rapt, mindless fascination. You can't see that he is a huge proporter of the Frankfurt School here. Pornographic films are thus the only potentation of films in general. Uh, which ask us to stare at the world as though it were a naked body. The mysterious thing, reading, becomes some superstitious and adult power which the lowlier arts, that is everything that is visual, imagine uncomprehendingly as animals may dream of the strangeness of human thinking. So if you watch television, if you watch movies, this is exactly what's happened to you. It's wrapped mindless fa um, fascination. Just reading, reading is the thing you ought to do. So again, he is very much in the tradition of the Frankfurt School in criticizing visual arts as being the lowlier arts, being made for people that just stare at it. They don't, they consume it. And that is why consume, as consuming in general is a bit of a problematic term when we look at po um, popular culture on the one hand and visual culture on the other, simply because it implies that you do so unthinkingly. However, this is of course only one line of thinking. So as I said, seeing and the gaze in Western tradition has also been lionized as the only true sense that is free from ideology, so to speak, which, surprise, surprise, it isn't. So we see a different strand of theoretical ideas and theoretical thinking about visual culture with the so-called pictorial turn. And this pictorial turn comes with a number of implications because it changes the idea of visual culture being lowlier arts into something that is worth studying and needs to be studied because it comes with implications. But also it uh, denotes a change in the question of viewership. So the viewer, the audience isn't a mass viewer, but it's the spectator, which is much more of an active term. So in this case, the pictorial term has led to the realization that spectatorship, the look, the gaze, the glance, etc., may be as deep of a problem as various forms of reading, that is decipherment, decoding, etc., and that the visual experience or visual literacy might be not fully explicable in the model of textuality. So what we need is a different way of reading it. We can't just say we do it just the same way as literature simply because visual culture is both a verbal kind of thing or an audio um, cultural product and a visual. So audio-visual denotes two kinds of levels that we always need to see in conjunction. A visual analysis or a, a film analysis is not complete without looking at the visual and it's not complete without looking at the text. And this is something that most of the criticism of the visual or of visual culture often disregards, that we have two levels that need to be seen in conjunction. Um, moving on in this case, seeing is not a natural ability. So those people that have argued that seeing is the truest sense we have that is free from ideolo uh, ideology, they are actually wrong simply because seeing is not a natural ability but it's rather intimately linked with the ways that our society has over time arranged its forms of knowledge, its strategies of power and its systems of desire. So. In this case, seeing, watching, the gaze, etc., is always implicated in questions of power. And these questions, some of these questions at least, are who is visible, who is being made visible, um, so is it marginalized groups or is it a certain societal ideal that is being made visible, who is being hidden by these sort of processes, um, but also the question is who makes these images, how are they being made and by whom? So the question of production is also vital. Is it a Hollywood, a Hollywood studio or is it an indie production? These questions, who makes these visual cultural products is vital. Okay, um, in this case, and this is the last part, so to speak, uh, the spectator in this case also changes from being the sort of um, 
What does Jameson says? The animal that dreams of human thinking, um, someone who doesn't read but simply consumes unthinkingly, this is also changed within this sort of pictorial turn that has been going on. So the, the question isn't any longer are they passive, but the question is how do people read these texts? And in this case, you can take up certain subject positions that are being given, to, that are being shown to you by visual culture. You can read them contrarily, you can reject them, etc., etc. So the spectator and the audience is an active part within this entire spectrum or within visual culture. And in this case, Fury and Fury note, the viewer or the spectator is equally dynamic and constantly shifting. The spectator is an agency uh, of the image as well as the culture. He, she cannot be passive, and this is important, and this directly contradicts the Frankfurt School that say they are passive. The, um, the viewer isn't passive in this case, um, but must always be located within a range of forces that determines and are di uh, determined by the image. So in this case, the, um, the spectator has agency, he, she has power, not only in the sense of these are subjects, uh, subject positions that I'm going to take on and do not take on, but also in the way that um, spectators and audiences may influence the continuation of a visual cultural product. If you think back of, uh, to the, uh, I think it was Brooklyn Nine-Nine that was sort of cancelled, and then the sort of fan base of the series kind of stepped in. They asked again and again, they wrote um, emails, they were very active in the process of cancellation and got it sort of reinstated um, um, on a different channel. But audiences are never just passive watchers. Some of them may be, but not all the time. Generally, audiences are active participants in this entire process of consuming, of watching, and sometimes even of producing um, visual culture. Um, on a different level, the question, or sort of why are we talking about it? Why do we need to talk about visual culture? Why is it important? Not only because of the spectatorship and of because our world is sort of implicated in images and sort of uh, full of images and saturated with them, but also because images do just as much as texts do reprint, uh, representational work for us. So um, I think there is, I do have a quote, I'm just going to skip that. Generally, we can, we can say that the allocation of visual space sort of indicates or at once indicates the place of certain marginalized groups or of groups in general, um, their place in the community and instructs us to the overall structure of society and the nature of societal relationships prevailing within it. So generally, if certain groups are represented in the media or are very often represented in the media, that is, for instance, the, as I've said before, the white Western middle-aged men, that becomes to a certain degree a standard. Those groups that are not represented or underrepresented or negatively uh, represented instructs viewers how society often sees these groups. So, um, and I'm just going to skip back to my, my um, actual example. For a very long time, women and marginalized groups have been, as some scholars have argued, subjected to so-called symbolic annihilation, which means that, in this case, symbolic annihilation, there, there has been an absence of representations and under-representation um, of a particular social group, so not necessarily just women, or a markedly strong pattern of negative representations. And that has led to um, women and marginalized groups being regarded as secondary citizens, of being disenfranchised, and with these sort of um, visual uh, representations having both a societal impact, but are also being fed by the society. So this is what um, I think it's, it's Hazan says, this is why um, there is an implication in visual culture that informs us about how our society works and how our society regards certain groups, but it also is informed by the society. So again, we have a dialectic process where popular or visual culture is informed by society and informs society in retrospect. Okay. <clears throat> Talking for about um, 70 minutes is not necessarily something you should do. Okay, which brings us to how do we talk about film? And this is, of course, the, the part uh, where uh, some of you might already know something, but um, if I just gave you 
this picture and ask you, you know, what's your impression of it? Who lives there, for instance? So just what kind of person would be situated in this frame, generally? Yeah. Sorry, again, the transmission from up there to down here is really bad. Yeah, there is one. Yeah, someone from the upper classes. Um, why someone from the upper classes? What makes you think that? So it's the opulent kind of uh, decor that indicates that someone who lives there obviously has the money to afford them. Yeah. Someone who has really interest in art. Yeah, someone not... Painting, you see the ceiling of the Absolutely. So again, someone from an upper class background potentially because they don't only have the economic potential but also uh, uh, capital but also the cultural capital to appreciate art and to buy it at some point. Yeah. What? Someone from, like like a priest or someone? <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's also some kind of um, religious um, iconography up there. But boy, that's a priest that has certainly sifted away a lot of money into his own pockets. Um, yes. Uh, what else? What about age, gender, etc.? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So someone who has a family um, and who puts pictures there. It's also very weirdly uh, like a display case. It's like, by the way, look, I have a family. Um, I'm a normally adjusted person. I don't know. Okay. Um, what else? What about age and gender? Yeah, middle-aged, white man, potentially, most likely. <clears throat> um, also, if, if, we, you know, if you lean far out, you can also say someone who is definitely not only of an upper-class background, but certainly someone older, so it's probably not someone in his early 20s who lives there, but certainly someone who is potentially beyond 45 at least. Uh, simply because of the accumulation of the, you know, the economic capital um, that is being shown in this room. Um, any other points? Yeah. <clears throat> Potentially not. <laughs> yeah, there might be inherited wealth, which again points to the class background. Yeah. Just imagine you have to dust all of that. Oh boy. Um, but yes, generally, the, your points and your comments are very valid and they are very, very true. The thing is, why did I give you this picture? Not just to um, ar arbitrarily figure out who might live there, but to show you that even a still frame, just something taken from a movie has not only implications, but is never a neutral background. So not only are film sets always constructed to a certain degree, but they are also never neutral. They already implicate and they already imply uh, certain actors, a certain, so potentially, uh, it's probably also time-wise, early 20th century, where inherited or a, either a very high class background or um, a earlier point in time or museum. So there are a couple of things that we can read from that. But the point is that no, um, none of these, these uh, backgrounds, none of the film sets are always neutral. They are always put to a certain effect and everything that's being in the scene is used and arranged to have a certain e effect. And this sort of, there is a term for that and I'm just going to very briefly switch off the camera so that people can actually see it on the live stream. And this is, and of course in this case there is no actor in it, but this is called a 
This is called a, the PowerPoint doesn't work, this is called a mise-en-scene. And that is simply, um, by the way, you don't need to write down the terms and the, the angles and the shots and whatnot. I've uploaded a like full page handout with all the film technical aspects that I will definitely not be able to cover in this session. So if you ever have a question and think, oh, what's mise-en-scene? How does lighting work? How does color work? How does costume work? This will be on this four page handout, which is, um, <clears throat> yes. I was nice enough to do that. At least, you know, in the last session, I'm doing something nice for you. Isn't that brilliant? Okay, so mise-en-scene is simply the arrangement of objects, of decor, of color, of light, of actors, etc., etc., in one frame that has a narrative purpose. This is why I said no background is neutral. That already tells us a story. So this mise-en-scene is usually separated in a couple of parts. So we have clothes and costume. Um, that may become iconic for characters, for instance, if I give you round glasses and a lightning bolt scar, you immediately think of Harry Potter. If I give you one of the robes, you also know it's about Harry Potter. So this is, can become I, um, sort of iconic for certain characters, so costume, again, is important. Talking about light and color, there are different kinds of lighting techniques. I'm going to break it down to high key and low key lighting. Um, we have Generally, also, when we talk about backgrounds, that's just a very, this is also the arrangement of, of lights and cameras, but what I wanted to point out, especially because, you know, decor and the room is usually not only an advantage, but also can be limiting. This is a, a film set of a sitcom. If you look, uh, if you watch sitcoms, you might have noticed that some sitcoms don't have ceilings, especially if they are studio sitcoms, simply because the ceiling is the sort of rigging for lights. Um, so again, film sets can also be limits to what can be shown and what is shown on screen. Um, but talking about light and color, we have high key and low key lighting. The difference is only whether it's evenly distributed lighting, that is high key lighting. So there are very rarely shadows um, and low key lighting would then be sort of what you see with the Joker. There's a pronounced difference between shadow and light. So there is um, much more of the sort of absence of any shadows where light is evenly distributed. Also in this case, we have a very good case of top lighting. But again, I'm not going to go into light too much. When it comes to color, I could talk a long time about that. Generally, um, maybe as a disclaimer and as a sort of point towards being careful with color, you will read that is something every time you read any review on films, et cetera, et cetera, or on film techniques, you will also always hear like, oh, green means fertility, it's for hope, blah, 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 or the Dutch angle is always used for this and that purpose. Um, try to erase these kinds of phrases from your vocabulary because green can be used in a number of ways. Um, that do not connote, um, you know, envy or hope or anything because all of that is sort of gri crystal gazing. Don't do that. Light and color and, and uh, camera angles can be used to varying degrees for very different purposes and they're always context dependent. So, I mean, I could say, oh, white light in this case is used to, um, you know, indicate a religious experience because white is the color of angels. Could I be wrong? Potentially, could I be right? Also potentially, in this case, it is a sort of transcendental experience, yes, but also potentially no, because Harry kind of dies, so death could also be white. Again, the context matters. Context matters when it comes to angles, <laughs> not Friedrich angles, <laughs> um, when it comes to, wow. Okay, when it comes to color, light, etc., etc. So context always matters when it comes to film. However, when we uh, look at color, what color often does is, uh, uh, is create contrasts. Uh, in this case, it's a scene but, um, from the uh, uh, show, oh God, The Crown. <laughs> I, I had the royals in mind, but that's not the name of the show, but it's The Crown. And in this case, everyone is dressed in earthly tones. It's browns and greens, um, sometimes a bit of white, but it's usually a grayish white. Except for Gillian Anderson, who plays Margaret Thatcher, who is in bright um, blue and uh, bright, a bright blue dress, and that connotes that she simply sticks out. She doesn't belong. She doesn't fit in. And this is what color can do, except for creating contrast. Also, can create narrative contrast in order to show you, show, don't tell you, 
um, that someone doesn't fit in without making it plain in the dialogue, simply to show you this person does not and will not fit in. Okay, um, moving on to actor and movement. Again, we see that here, different um, arrangements, blocking, etc., which also brings us to a certain degree to the mise-en-scene. This is something I've, again, covered on the handout, but it brings us to camera work, and this is where it gets interesting, but where I, again, rush through. So there are different ways of focusing in distance. Usually, if we talk about camera work, we talk about small depth of field or large depth of field. Small depth of field, um, and I'm going to use this figurine extensively in the next five to ten minutes, and I'm also not sorry for it. So small depth of field would usually mean every, just I say, absolutely um, obvious kind of uh, comment, but every image can be separated in foreground, middle ground, and background. So the books and the microphone would be background, this would be the middle ground, this is the foreground. Small depth of field means only one plane is actually uh, focused on. So either it's the foreground or it's the middle ground or it's the background. Small depth of field means only one of these ground, um, middle, fore and background is actually focused on. Large depth of field, this is again small depth of field, Again, I've explained that, and uh, large depth of field would mean that everything is in focus. You can see everything. And uh, foreground, middle ground, and background always are in relation with one another, and large depth of field sort of allows the full spectrum to be shown. It's often a bit difficult then to interpret, but generally, small, uh, large depth of field simply means that there is, uh, or everything is in focus. Also, just, if, you know, moving on from focus and distance, we have the framing, and this is a long shot where everything is visible. Usually you have long shots, pan long shots to establish a scene. I say usually or conventionally, again, can be used for different purposes. Um, and as we move along, the camera also moves generally closer to the subject it shows. And this is done, for instance, by a medium long shot where still the entire person is shown and the background. So again, there is a relationship between background and foreground, between the person that moves in this, this foreground, but generally the person is completely shown in this case. Moving closer, again, it's the medium shot where it's usually um, way above the hips and the shoulders that is being shown that often, again, often, creates a more personal kind of um, relationship between viewer and the subject that is being shown on screen. It's also often used for very quick editing in conversations, but again, we're much closer to the subject, which means that we align ourselves also often much closer with the subject. Moving even closer, it's the medium close-up. Um, again, that's usually above the shoulders. We see the expressions, so something you, for instance, don't see during a theater performance. You see the expressions of the actors. Again, that can be used to create intimacy, but can also use, uh, be used to sort of deconstruct intimacy. Again, don't, you know, don't essentialize these kinds of camera angles and close-ups. Um, then again, the close-up is, well, even closer to the subject. Um, you can often only see the face, um, I think there is this f famous scene um, from Get Out where the camera zooms in on this absolutely horrified face of uh, the main character. That would be, for instance, a close-up. And then there is, of course, the uh, extreme close-up, which is in this case a blank white space. It should have usually been the eye, but I think the picture was far too grainy to do that. But extreme close-ups are used to point the viewer to something he or she or they would not necessarily see but that's actually vital for the narration. Again, something you can only do in film because no one really moves so close to someone else in the room and just kind of stares at their hands or something. So sleight of hands can, for instance, yes, thank you for, for doing exactly that. It's not creepy at all. Um, I mean, you can do it, but I would not recommend you to do it. Um, so, but that is something um, of, of sort of showing you something you would not necessarily be able to see in sleight of hands. Certain narrative devices that are vital for the narration can be shown through extreme close-ups. Which brings us to height and angles. Again, we have the figurine, and I think you should be familiar with some of these angles and heights already. So we have the bird view or the bird's eye view the high angle, the low angle, and the super low angle. Um, all of them can have different purposes. 
Sometimes, especially um, these kinds of angles, are used in order to either denote the viewer as being on the same height as a child, for instance, to show the subject in the frame being superior to a certain degree. Again, it's just one reading, whereas this can be just uh, used either to create inferiority, but again, these are conventional uses of these angles in general. Okay. Um, Yes, I'm not going to show you this scene because simply we don't have the time for it. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, stop the, uh, the, the presentation and um, give you time for questions concerning the final exam, concerning visual culture in general. Are there any questions, anything you really, really want to ask me simply because this is your moment? I mean, you can still ask your tutors, but, you know, um, get the truth from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Yes. In how much do you expect us to know the literary periods? <laughs> um, how, how do I frame that? So, in how far do I expect you to know the historic periods and events? I do not expect you to know what happened in 1832. I do not expect you to recount every single characteristic of the classic period in English literature. What would be good to know would be certain important authors that I've mentioned. It would be good to know at least some characteristics of all periods of literature. You know, just regular things. If I were to ask you what are the defining features of the neoclassical period, for instance, then you should be able to point out at least three of them. Like, um, this is usual motives, this is usual topics, and these two authors are very famous for the neoclassical period. So, broad ideas. Also, if I were to ask you about, I don't know, the old English period, it would be nice if you knew that Chaucer has written something, and it would be even better if you knew the title of Chaucer's uh, work. Okay. What else? Yes. So you should be familiar with the theories, you should be familiar with the main aspects. This is why I've given you these sort of TLDR slides, main thinkers, main points, rough idea of what these theories are about. You don't need to cite, you don't need to quote, but you need to know the main thinkers, you need to know the main points. Of all of them, of course, because before, you know, to, just to circumvent the is it vital um, question. Okay, anything else? Because I, I really rushed through visual culture in about mm, 45 minutes, I don't exp and I didn't manage the reading. Usually there would have been, as you can see, there would have been a reading not just of the camera angles, but of uh, transformers and so on and so forth. Also of get out, white gaze, male gaze. We are not going to manage that. I'm going to give you a very brief rundown anyway. Um, if you want to read it. It's something I've done before, but generally we're not going to go through that um, simply because unless you want to do a reading of these two things in three minutes, which will not be pleasure, uh, you know, not satisfying for any one of us, so uh, let's not do that. So no, you don't need to, to know um, Get Out by Heart or you don't need to know the movie at all in this case. Also, generally, 
uh, you don't need to know any kind of work by heart. So I don't expect you to have read Shakespeare from you know, bookend to bookend. That's not the case. If there's a text, I will give you the text. You have the text on the, you know, on the final exam. There is no additional text knowledge you need, technically. Yes. Yes. I will do that. I think I've uploaded up until last week um, even the slides that I haven't covered and I've skipped through. So usually these are just the quotes, um, but I'll upload these slides also um, today. <laughs> and everyone's like, can't you please stop? I want to leave. Okay. Um, if there are no questions, again, I, I believe that Lena and Alma and Hannah are doing some kind of Q&A right before the uh, final exam. If there are any pressing questions, pressing questions that do not include when does it take place, spoiler alert, next week on Tuesday morning uh, in this very you know, lecture hall, just to make sure that I've said it again, but generally it takes place here as we've done for the rest of the semester. Okay, that being said, um, thank you very much. I'm going to send around a feedback slide also for you to fill in. I'm going to send a message anyways, but thank you very much for your participation. It was a rather pleasant kind of experience. It was the first time I did this lecture. Hopefully no one noticed. Um, but generally, thank you very much for being here and for participating. It was a pleasure working with you, and I hope and I wish you good luck for the final test next week. We're going to see each other next week, but thank you again. I wanted to say that before you know, everyone rushes off into their well-deserved vacation. So thank you very much, and um, good luck for next week. <laughs>